Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining the Garrison Institute's live interactive webinar. Our guest today is Martel Catalano. Martel Catalano is an executive director and co-founder of Beyond My Battle, a nonprofit focused on reducing the stress of serious illness, rare disease, and disability through emotional support and resources rooted in mindfulness. Martel has studied with fellow, fellow Garrison Institute teachers such as Dan Siegel and Sharon Salzberg and has over 500 hours of training in yoga, restorative yoga, and meditation. She holds an MBA in sustainable business and is recognized as an emerging nonprofit voice, bridging the gap between diagnosis and emotional well being. She's dedicated to helping individuals and families cope with health related uncertainty by cultivating self awareness, compassion, and supportive relationships. Martel lives with a rare disease called retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative eye condition that slowly diminishes one's vision, leading to blindness. She lives in Saratoga Springs, New York. Before we begin today, I will go over a few logistical items about our gathering. We are on a Zoom webinar, so participant audio and video will be off. You will, you will only see Martel and for the time being myself. For anyone un, unable to attend live, we are recording these sessions. You will have a chance to view the recordings as soon as the, as soon, um, as well as the schedule of upcoming programs at garrisoninstitute.org. We offer these sessions for uh, free of charge as a goodwill gesture to support our community during such times of heightened uncertainty. We would welcome donations of any amount to help us continue to offer these sessions. Thank you. Finally, we will have time for Q&A during this gathering. You can post your questions in the Q&A panel, which is accessible at the bottom of the screen by hovering your arrow over the Q&A button. We are on for an hour today and will respond to as many questions as we can. Please forgive us if we're unable to get to your question. Thank you again, Martel, for being here with us today and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, hi. <laughs> hi everyone, it's such an honor to be here. And before we begin, I wanna let you know that later on um, during our session, I'm going to offer a meditation that I'll ask you to just jot down a few things after. So it might be a good idea to have a pen and paper or just the notes section of your phone or a blank document on your computer. But for now, I'd like to just start by finding a moment of presence together. So if you'll take a moment to just close your eyes or have a soft gaze down the bridge of your nose and begin to feel into your body. First, moving it in any way to achieve a state of comfort for yourself. Maybe you're taking this webinar from your bed or lying down on a couch, or maybe you're sitting up at a desk. Wherever you are, simply observing any physical sensation. It could be comfort, it could be tightness, heat, coolness, vibration, be the clothes on the skin, the body on the chair or the bed. Just noticing. And if there is any tension, perhaps trying for a moment to release some. And I know that releasing all tension is, or it could be pain, might be impossible. But it could just be relaxing the jaw right now or relaxing the shoulders. Or maybe it's stretching out your legs through your toes, taking a moment to do just whatever feels good in your body. And now I'm just taking a moment to Drop into how you're feeling. Not physical feeling, but an emotional kind of feeling. 
What are the qualities of your emotions today? Not good or bad, but more subtle emotions. So emotional heaviness, numbness, fullness, emptiness. Or maybe you're able to pinpoint certain emotions like excitement or anger, sadness, fear. And let us not claim these emotions right now, but just notice them. So it might be helpful to say them to yourself. If you notice sadness, just saying the word sadness to yourself. Or presence, just simply saying presence. Taking a moment to just observe. And now slowly beginning to just take a deep inhale into the belly, filling yourself up. And then with a sigh out, take your exhale. Coming to slowly open the eyes. So hopefully we're now feeling a bit more tuned in and a little bit more grounded. So as was mentioned earlier, I run a nonprofit organization I founded a few years ago called Beyond My Battle. Um, I started this organization with a friend of mine because we knew that no matter the diagnosis, we're all going through the same emotional challenges and themes. So I'm incredibly happy to be here with you all today sharing the ways that we can start to cope with those emotions, that stress, and those emotional themes of having any kind of illness or disability. And there's this really insightful publication from 2005 that explains how all the various kinds of stressors that people have, uh, financial, social, uh, mental, physical, fused together and are exacerbated for those living with illnesses. Meaning that um, having ma managing an illness, whether it's one that is like having a full-time job or one that poses just daily obstacles and forces you to make constant rearrangements is simply added stress on top of the pre-existing stress that we all face as 21st century human beings. So having a medical condition predisposes us to have deeper financial, social, emotional, and of course, physical uh, stress than the average person. So when I started Beyond My Battle, it was in part because there is just so much research out there to support that having or caring for someone with an illness or a disability is incredibly stressful. And there's even more research to support the many, many ways that stress makes us sick. I could not stand to think that for those of us living with illnesses or disabilities, we were making ourselves more sick by not knowing how to properly manage our stress. And then lastly, as I'm sure you all know, there is lots of research out there on how compassion and mindfulness practices can alleviate the stress of both patients and caregivers. So today I'm going to talk about coping with chronic illness and disability, but what I first wanted to say before we get into all of that is that you have every right to feel stressed and overwhelmed and frustrated and while I am a firm believer in the Buddha's teachings and philosophy that life is full of suffering and sickness and disability for all human beings, and if only every person in the world um, could recognize that, there would probably be little to no stigma about having an illness or a disability. I'm also here to say that you are not crazy to think that it is just a little bit more intense for you because there's plenty of data to support it, and it is. <laughs> but the thing is um, that I talk to people most often, often about is as much as we um, know that people living with health, health, health conditions of any kind are living um, with lots and lots of stressful stuff, uh, we can't often fix or control or change a diagnosis. So what we can do is we can learn to be more okay with it. And we can learn how to respond to it more compassionately. And in doing so, I think we can also help others do the same. So as someone with a rare disease myself, I've met so many people like myself um, and like all the people in their lives who are focusing on the future, 
and mostly focusing on a cure for whatever disease someone has or their loved ones have. And while we certainly definitely need scientists and advocates, we also need someone to teach us how to manage the now, to manage all the feelings that we carry day in and day out of our brokenness, of our anger at our bodies, uh, the pity, frustration, fear, helplessness. We need someone to help us manage that too, instead of, uh, in, in addition to thinking about the future and a cure. So in the moment, I'd like to just take, uh, ask you to take a few seconds to really just thank yourself for signing up for this webinar um, because you are taking a moment to look to make peace with the present. And that's a big, really big deal. And I know, um, I feel like I'd be remiss to not mention COVID in, in a conversation about health, but um, <laughs> I know that COVID has really intensified the isolation and the fear that so many of us living with illnesses or disabilities have. But I also want to say that COVID has additionally taught everyone uh, some really valuable lessons, right? That those of us with illnesses and disabilities may already be very well aware of. And that's that life is not necessarily fair, that each day is so uncertain, that the goals or the expectations uh, we create are so often changed, and that it's perhaps better to live more day by day and in each day to accept the cards that we've been dealt. So for us, those cards may look different than most people, but remember there is truth to what the Buddha taught, right? So we're all suffering, we're all getting sick, we're all dying, I know it's a shocker. Um, but so if we're working on coping with that now um, and everything in between, I kind of think we're getting out ahead of the vast majority of the population. So it's kind of like a gift or a superpower or however you want to look at it. But um, before I go into anything more, I want to acknowledge that we only have an hour together today. And so I'm going to talk about some overarching topics that have to do with coping with an illness or disability, but I won't be going super in depth um, as I wanna respect our time together. And that being said, you might find that um, some of what I talk about, you might wanna dive deeper into, uh, especially in the sense that you might wanna explore how it personally applies to you in unique ways. Um, so if that's the case, there are links uh, provided by the Garrison Institute kindly um, on how to explore my personal approach to all of this further, uh, particularly a course I'll be teaching in early 2021. Uh, and also know that Beyond My Battle is a resource for you and also for anybody in your life. So our services are, we provide emotional support and educational resources on managing that stress associated with illness and disability um, by taking a mindful and compassionate approach to it. But uh, we provide everything in not just for uh, patients, but also for caregivers. And lastly, of course, we'll have time at the end of the webinar for questions. So um, with that being said, uh, there are so many techniques that I use to manage the stress that I, ha that I have from living with a disability and a degenerative disease. Um, but I'm not gonna be walking us through all those tools today as I expect many of you have your own go-to go -to methods for coping or cultivating a sense of calm in your life. Uh, it could be meditation, nature walks, uh, exercise, anti-inflammatory diets. It would be a very, very long webinar. And it's not necessarily um, the first place to, to start. I think um, what we're gonna focus on today is really the mindset that any of that coping, um, any of that coping that you do for an illness or a disability requires of us. And this is a mindset that I believe uh, requires us to be vulnerable, compassionate, and communicative. So vulnerability, compassion, and communication are something that all humans everywhere need to work on and definitely benefit every kind of person in the world. But I feel that when we're living with any kind of diagnosis, um, it's just that much more difficult to do. And let me explain why. So we have 
so much internalized messaging um, and we oftentimes literally rely on other people for help in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, in other words, these, um, these are useful assets for anyone or everyone, but there is just some extra, extra what I would call blocks or blockages um, when, uncutter when uncluttering that internal landscape that we have when living with an illness or a disability. So we might find ourselves um, pushing these things away and that's completely normal. Um, we all know that feeling of like pushing away uh, things that are best for us or things that are good for us. In fact, there's, there's some really interesting research um, actually done about the outcomes of illness related stress. And one of them is that we tend to neglect self care. So people avoid going to the doctor or taking medications or following certain protocols when they're really anxious or depressed um, about their diagnosis. So you can imagine that it's also likely that we might avoid acts like cultivating the mindset I'm gonna be talking about today. So again, thank yourself for being here. I think it's the greatest thing and um, the, first, the first step is learning about all this and, and being curious. So um, I say to people really all the time along these lines that you can do all of the yoga, you can drink all of the green smoothies and you can take all of the supplements um, in the world. <laughs> but um, in so many ways, that's, that's the easy stuff to do. Um, but if you don't own your story and have at least one person that you can talk to, then you're going to feel stuck and you're going to be missing out on a fundamental part, or I should say fundamental parts of managing stress and coping with health-related uncertainty and making uh, peace with, with the unasked for or the unknown, which I think is, is so much of our fear. Um, so let's start by talking about vulnerability. <sighs> it's a topic that I feel like um, even just saying it kind of can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. So again, relax into your seat if, if, you, if you're finding yourself maybe tensing up a little bit. A little bit. Um, but I feel that we really can't move into genuine compassion and authentic communication with others if we don't first lean into vulnerability. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the works of Brene Brown, who is a really well-known and well-respected teacher and author and researcher on vulnerability. Um, she often talks about vulnerability and shame going hand in hand, um, that our shame really can't outlive or outpower our vulnerability because shame dies when it is um, like seen or spoken. So it's important to understand shame and how all of us have it. And I, I don't mean everyone on this call, I mean literally everyone in the world. Um, in my personal life and in professional work though, I have found that it's extremely hard to find anyone who is rid of shame, but especially hard in the illness and disability community. And that's because, um, well, it's because shame tells us that we are flawed and we are unworthy. And society tells us that having an illness or disability makes us flawed. So we then go on to internalize that as being unworthy of specifically of love, um, familial love, platonic love, romantic love, really any kind. Um, and we don't like to feel uncomfortable. So we tend to shy away from things that make us feel vulnerable in the first place. So I've talked to hundreds of people, uh, many women especially, who tell me stories about they have hid or they are hiding their illness or their disability, um, especially if it's an invisible kind um, from other people. They won't tell people, they've someone they've been dating for months. They will hide it from employers for a long time, maybe forever. Um, they... Per, I've, I've met people who it's a total secret and only just a couple of people in their life get to know about it. So whenever I hear this, my heart breaks because I know that pain and not just that pain, but that exhaustion. Um, it's to me, it feels like carrying around a backpack filled with bricks every day because hiding a fundamental part of who you are 
is such a heavy burden. It is so tiring. Um, we talk about burnout a lot, and I think that that's a major component of it. Um, but in, for example, in my teens, I was teenage years. Um, I was really disconnected and disassociated from my disease, and I I brushed it off completely. I didn't want to talk about it, um, not just with friends, but really even at home. And because I was so young, I was not emotionally mature enough to really put the pieces together. But in my 20s, when I started to, I guess, mature, um, I was still carrying this weight. And I, at first, I didn't quite know what it was, but I felt this, this heavy burden. And I felt something starting to really, you know, fester inside of me. Um, it's something that had been stuffed down so frequently for so long that it was ready to explode. And um, sometimes it did. And sometimes it did in outbursts or acts of defiance and lots of self-sabotage, which I'm sure many of you can relate to some of that, at least at least a bit of. Um, but I share this because I can, I can relate to the shame that so many of us feel when carrying around something that we didn't ask for. Something that makes us feel unworthy or incapable or burdensome, a word that I hear all the time, I'm, I'm a burden, right? Um, but the way I see it is that we really have two choices here. We can continue to carry around that heavy backpack, which by the way, is only going to get heavier and literally make us harm our, harm our health in different ways because stress like that lodges in the body and is associated with a host of other illnesses. Um, or we can start to empty the backpack. And we empty that backpack really one brick at a time, um, little by little, by acknowledging the parts of ourselves that feel uncomfortable, by claiming all of the subtle or maybe apparent parts of ourself. And um, we're really coming to know them. And then later we can start to begin to express who we are in all of our fullness, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but for me, and um, another example, this, this initially for me looked like acknowledging that I wasn't just night blind, but that I was going blind during the day too. And from there, it was recognizing the fears that I had about not seeing places in the world that I wanted to visit or not being able to, um, or, or, or losing my independence. Um, I had to admit these things to myself before I could start to express them to others. So, um, well, eventually, you know, this all starts to feel really freeing or like, you know, weight off the shoulders, um, letting go of parts of ourself or not necessarily parts of ourself, but things that we've internalized uh, or that we've been carrying around for so long, perhaps our entire lives, um, it can feel really scary and really strange at first. Um, so I want to acknowledge that because I, I know I don't want to make it sound like it's all, um, you know, butterflies or unicorns or whatever. Um, but I think a great place to start is through small acts of self-awareness. Um, so small acts of self-awareness means getting to know for, um, our behaviors and our triggers. Um, and I think this is really helpful when stepping into vulnerability because our behaviors and our triggers especially inform us about the not so lovely side of ourself that we let out when we feel aggravated by or trapped by our illness or our disability. So um, we begin to experience what it's like to feel vulnerable when we can explore and start to recognize and see these parts of ourselves. Um, that being said, uh, you know, unicorns and butterflies aside, like I said, it can be scary and it can be um, uncomfortable. Uh, it can feel really like icky is the word that I use uh, oftentimes to describe it. It can feel icky to pull back layers of our self and find triggers, like those things that set you off. It could be 
for it could be seeing someone in a situation you wish that you had or um, people ask, you know, strangers in the supermarket asking you about your condition or not being able to do something you used to do. Uh, it's really different for everyone, um, but discovering these is essential. And similarly, you might um, encounter shame here. You might encounter shame when you realize those, those behavioral patterns, uh, the responses that we have to either a trigger or just a buildup of emotion. Um, it could be that nasty voice that you use with the people you love, or it could be being judgmental to somebody you hardly know in order to deflect what you're feeling about yourself, or it could be emotional overeating. Um, again, it's, it's different for everybody. Uh, and, and you might want to build a wall up against it or run away from it when we start to find them again. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I mentioned earlier that is, is the, uh, the stuff that I dig deeper in outside of this lecture. And I think is just the best place to start for learning how to cope with your condition. Um, but the real vulnerability comes when we begin to share this with others, right? Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but before we can go there, I think it's really important to, to be with whatever we have found about ourselves in a compassionate way. So leaning into those parts of ourselves with a sense of kindness. Um, and otherwise I feel that it won't be, uh, what we're, what we need to communicate won't really be communicated very effectively. So then let's talk about compassion. <laughs> so what I find in this world is that we're searching for a middle ground, a, a place where we own our condition, but not so much that it owns us. Um, and if that doesn't make sense, I guess what I'm saying is we want to, you know, with that vulnerability, we want to recognize our condition as part of us, but not where it's our entire identity. So this is where I think compassion really comes in. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with self-compassion work and self-compassion practices. And if you are, um, you know that it's made up of three parts, um, according to Dr. Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer, who really lead the, the research and the, um, the movement on the self-compassion front. Um, but those three parts are self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. Um, now, I don't, you know, just to respect our time today, I, I won't be diving into all of those because, you know, we only have an hour but I think, you know, you get the idea. We need to be kinder to ourselves, which means releasing judgment or differences or our needs or really the standards that we have set for ourselves or our family has set for us or society at large has, has created and, and not trying to fix things that are unfixable. Um, and then we need to remember that we're all human that no human being is without unfixable bits or battles that they're fighting. So, you know, a great example is that we wouldn't talk to a stranger in, such, in probably the critical way that we talk to ourselves oftentimes about our condition. Um, and so when we find these icky parts of ourselves through that exploration and that vulner getting vulnerable with ourselves, um, we must talk to ourselves in the same way that we would talk to that stranger, right? Because we're all going through this. Um, it's different, but we're all experiencing that, that, that common humanity really means that we're all experiencing the same, the same emotions. Um, and lastly, we, we need to work to be here now. So that's that mindfulness component in our, in our wholeness, like I talked about earlier, not just the illness or the stories that it tells us, but the moment to moment of, of really just being alive on earth. So that's where those mindfulness practices that so many great teachers that um, speak with the Garrison Institute um, share, share how to do. Um, but, you know, in support groups that I run, a topic that often comes up when we, when we talk about compassion and vulnerability and, and communication um, is that we don't want to be perceived as the the sick person. Um, we feel that 
speaking our vulnerability into existence, again, communicating it with other people um, will give others permission to label us. So to think that we are unqualified to in the workplace or to be a parent or whatever it is. Um, but I, I disagree with this completely. Uh, and that's because the people that I have met with in the world of illness and disability who are compassionate with themselves are truly the strongest, most resilient, most honest people I have ever met. And they're the people who tell you or tell me that they're not feeling well today. They're, they admit their fears out loud. Um, they, they don't beat themselves up over them. And if anything, they explore them with a sense of curiosity so that they can understand themselves better and then show up to the world more authentically um, and honestly receive the support that they're looking for and the love that they're looking for. Um, so that's really why I feel that compassion has to be part of being vulnerable with ourselves before we can start to communicate that vulnerability with other people. Um, it creates resilience and it changes the way that you interact with, with the other people, which again, we need when we are living with a, any kind of physical limitation, whether we, whether we like it or not. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, so many people tell me that they feel that their illness or disability um, or, you know, caregivers of people with illnesses and disabilities often say this too. They feel that this experience has given them this profound gift of greater compassion. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about this, it's because by knowing our own struggles, our own challenges, um, when we know our own battle, um, because of that, we know that every person on the street is facing their own as well. Um, you know, remember when I said superpower earlier, this is kind of what I'm talking about. These are the lessons that everyone needs to learn at some point in their life. And um, compassion is a tool that the world would undeniably be a better place um, if there was more of it, especially now. So uh, when we start to be more self-compassionate, it becomes so much easier to communicate whatever we've come to find out about ourselves with others, um, especially in a way that is, is soft and not abrasive. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure we've all had those experiences where we've attempted to talk to someone about what we're feeling regarding our illness or disability, or, or it could be a totally um, a side subject matter that um, just the stress that we've harbored is, is making its way into, um, but we've said it in a way that it, it doesn't come off, it doesn't come off right. And um, whether, again, whether we like it or not, uh, the way that we communicate with other people is going to end up be, being really important. So, um, then let's, yeah, we can get into talking about communication. Ah, so many people don't wanna hear this, but <laughs> we need other people. Um, one of my favorite teachers who was mentioned earlier, um, Dan Siegel says that from a really early age, every human being regulates our emotional state by feeling that there is at least someone else in the world who's feeling what we're feeling too. Um, it, it doesn't mean that they need to fully comprehend everything that we're feeling in that moment, um, but just being there uh, in a compassionate way with someone is something that um, we need, again, from early infancy onward through the rest of our lives. So that being said, um, I really feel that most people <laughs> uh, like solutions that don't include others more than the ones that do, because um, the ones that don't include other people means that we have sole control over the situation. Um, we turn to things like diet and exercise and meditation. Um, all are so, so important things that I practice nearly every day um, and so great to have in your toolkit for everyone, especially for those of us living with that increased amount of stress. Uh, 
but they're not enough when dealing with life altering stress with, with chronic stress. Um, and that's the kind of stress that again, will make us more sick than we might already be. So um, the truth is that human neurobiology is just such that social engagement is our first line of defense when coping with stress, right? Like after we're born, every person on earth requires the love and connection from at least one person to survive. Um, doesn't even have to be a parent. We, but we look to someone else in an attempt to communicate literally everything we need or feel. Um, for a few years of our, of our, of our, you know, human development. So communication is the most human thing out there. And I don't feel like it is um, talked about enough in terms of stress management. Again, like we love those quick fixes. We love the things we can do just ourselves. Um, but, uh, you know, well, every, and you know, that's true for everybody. Everybody, again, needs to connect with other people. It's, it's incredibly human. It's our human nature. Um, but it's essential for those of us uh, living with illnesses and disabilities because we really need to have that strong, supportive, safe relationships that we can turn to when we need help because um, we might and probably do need assistance more than the average person. Uh, I'll use myself as an example. Because of my um, degenerative disease and disability, I cannot drive. Um, if only you know one could walk to every place on earth, but of course they can't. So it's really important for me to ensure that I have, and I am I'm very lucky to have um, pe a few people in my life that I know that I can always turn to. And that really comes down to the way that I communicate with them. Um, but I know uh, it might not feel like turning to others during times of stress or sadness or fear. Um, we might not feel like doing that. Uh, again, it's that that vulnerability and that shame or you know the word that I used earlier that I hear just so often um, feeling like you're a burden. Um, and it might feel like turning to others is kind of the opposite of what feels natural. Um, especially if we've been raised in an environment that's very pull yourself up by the bootstraps, um, that kind of mentality. Um, and we, we might have been taught in some way or another, maybe not communicated directly um, at some point in our lives, we might have been taught that like struggling makes us stronger. But um, I'd argue again that the, that communicating with others, asking for help is the most natural thing on earth. And it's the discomfort of that programming I just mentioned, which isn't. Um, it's the layers of shame and stigma that have built up over our human experience that are preventing us, that it might be preventing us from making um, the connection we need with others. It's, it's not some kind of protection mechanism. Um, we actually protect ourselves the most by surrounding ourselves with people who we can talk to, who we can ask for help from, who we can turn to in those, those big moments that are stressful or the little ones. Um, and I say this especially because the word isolation is perhaps the most common adjective we we receive when we do surveys through Beyond My Battle of our community. Um, you know, I was a little surprised by that at first. Uh, I thought it might be um, embarrassment or not or or just fear, anger. There's a lot of that too. Frustration is a big one, but always isolation beats the rest. Um, we feel a, a sentiment that I hear all the time in this community is that uh, we feel like. Um, nobody understands us. <laughs> and um, some, you know, sometimes that can be for very good reason, depending on the, the kind of um, community you have around you. So, um, you know, all that being said, I think it's, I've made it pretty clear that we really need to talk about things. And it's, it's the type of things um, that I think are a, cr a critical component to discuss when we, when we talk about communication, because it's not just the I have an illness, I take these medications, these are the doctors that I go to. It's the emotional side of our condition. So 
heading back to that vulnerability. Um, but, you know, using myself again as an example, uh, when I share, for instance, the embarrassment of talking to a, a wall for five minutes at a party because I can't see or the fear of not being able to see my future children or the frustration that I couldn't apply to a job that I really wanted because of the limitations of my disease, not allowing me to be able to get there by myself. Um, it doesn't matter about the circumstance that I mentioned because everyone can relate to the feelings of embarrassment, of fear, of frustration, and of feeling limitation. Um, there is something about the human connection of all having experienced the same emotions no matter what. So um, when we communicate our stories, we have to let ourselves be vulnerable enough to share the emotions with, with other people so that the person we're talking to can connect with us. Um, they almost certainly have not had your experience with your condition. They almost certainly do not have your diagnosis but they certainly have had the same emotions as you. And so I find that it's really not the comparisons, but the commonalities that are the most beneficial um, for us when living with some kind of medical condition. And I, and I would argue that this is the same for caregivers as well, if there are, if there are any caregivers listening. Um, but another thing I found in, in the communication realm is, um, and, and part of why we started Beyond My Battle is that it's important to talk across disabilities, um, not just within our own disability category. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. But um, if we want to find that um, those commonalities and, and not get stuck in the comparisons, um, then we really must be willing to talk outside of our diagnosis specifically. Uh, we also don't need a hundred people to do this. Not everyone earns the right to hear our story, especially at the beginning of owning it. Um, my best friend has, who's the co-founder of Beyond My Battle has cystic fibrosis. And when she and I talk with each other about our health conditions, we um, talk a lot more about the internal dialogues we have than the medications or, or, rich, or, or regimens we're on because um, it, we talk about the heart of the struggle, that shame or the fear or the sadness. And I, I really firmly believe that opening yourself up to people who don't just have your condition will not only help you avoid getting trapped in that bubble, but it will also help you feel more understood. So um, we're going to move into just a short meditation soon, and then um, you can write down a few things and we'll take some questions. But I just wanted to conclude with a quote that I really love by, um, by Tara Brock, who I'm sure many of you know, that says, when we put down ideas of what life should be like, we are free to wholeheartedly say yes to life as it is. And this always really speaks to the heart of life with illness and disability for me. Um, you know, we're grieving a life that that could have been, and perhaps we do that every day. Uh, so, so much of this work with vulnerability and compassion and communication is letting go of our attachments to that life. Um, or as John Kabat-Zinn says, letting be. So letting the life that we have really just be what it is. And it takes time. It doesn't happen in certainly an hour. It may take us, you know, most of our lives, but it's a journey with lots of ups and downs, and it's it's a journey that's really worth the effort. So with that being said, I think it's time for um, just a few moments of contemplation. So uh, let's all come to close our eyes. And just allow your hands to soften wherever they are. Find a comfortable seat or lying down in a way that's most comfortable in this moment. At any time, you can always readjust yourself to find more comfort. And just starting to take note of our breath as it moves in and out of the body naturally. Noticing if it's smooth, if it's quick. Maybe where you feel the breath the most in the body today. So belly or chest.
And I know so many of us come to this work with lots of judgment. So let's begin right now by just releasing any judgment for the breath or the feelings in the body. Smiling softly at the beauty of the breath, however it's showing up today and relaxing into this idea that our bodies might just be perfect how they are right now. And if any tension arises, simply acknowledging that, that sensation and readjusting in a way to become more comfortable at any time. I want you to use your breath as a home base during this practice. Coming home to the breath when the mind drifts away, whether it's a whole cycle of breath or somewhere in the body, just revisiting it every time. Come back to the breath as many times as you need. And now I want your awareness to just become a bit curious the next time the mind moves away. So instead of focusing on the breath in these moments, I want you to just greet whatever you find, whatever comes up. But working to do so with the same non-judgmental attitude, just like we did with our breath and our body. I just want you to ask yourself what's here right now. Are we bringing any emotions, anything going on in our lives, anything from the past? So without judgment, I want you to just observe and acknowledge anything that comes up. We're, we're being curious and not critical. I'm just seeing what's here for a few breaths. Just relaxing into anything uncomfortable that might arise. Anything that comes up might be in an attempt to protect us because we'd rather not feel vulnerable. So we might feel that natural impulse to push it away. But if you can, I want you to lean in. Landing on whatever comes up for you holding whatever is here with a sense of compassion, maybe taking a hand or both hands or the imagery of your hands, if hands are not available to you, to any part of your body where you feel what came up for you. Maybe extending your breath to this place, through the arms, out through the fingers. Dropping into this sense of a loving connection, sending breath to this part of our body and just sitting with whatever has come up for you for a few intentional breaths.
Just observing what it feels like to send love to yourself, not shaming whatever's here, greeting it as something we can be with, and maybe thanking it for showing up today. Now just slowly allowing yourself to release your hands, moving back into the wholeness of your body, moving back into the awareness of the room around you. And taking a moment to thank yourself for inviting vulnerability in before slowly starting to open the eyes, taking one last deep breath, maybe a sigh out of the mouth with your exhale again. And now looking at the time, we're gonna move into questions, but um, I invite you to take that pen and paper or that document and um, write really anything or something that came up for you during that practice. It could be bullet, bullet points about emotions. It could be um, the part of your body you felt drawn to or short letter to yourself or an affirmation. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, take, we'll start to take some questions now. So thank you all so much. Wonderful. So we have some questions here in the Q&A box. Um, there's uh, someone who wrote, as a caregiver, how hard should I try to offer help if my loved one refuses to ask and I know they need it? Mm. I'm so glad there are caregivers here, first of all. Um, it's, so, it's also so stressful, so I want to acknowledge that. Uh, I don't, I, I think that, it, you know, working on yourself first as a caregiver, the term that we use often um, in this work is co-regulation. And I'm not sure, you know, maybe you've heard that term before, but um, we, we offer co-regulation um, by loaning our calmness to someone else. So first I'd say to maybe just take a, a step back and evaluate the way that you're offering help, um, the, the tone of voice, the, the facial affect, all of the gestures, all of these things really play into um, the way that we um, even do the nicest thing in the world to someone else. So, um, and then I would say, I wouldn't push too hard. Um, you know, for those of us who are living with conditions that require help, and for so long, I, I did not want to ask for help about things in my life. Um, we get to a point where we really just need it. Um, and I feel like they'll come to you. So, I hope that's a helpful answer. I think it's kind of a two-part answer in terms of um, really evaluating how you're approaching your loved one. And then, um, yeah, maybe stepping back from it for a little while and seeing if they come to you. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, let's see, Elizabeth here says, hi Martel, great talk. I have aphasia so and find it hard to express myself in speech. Hence, I am quiet so as to not be misunderstood. Any tips? Yeah, that's a really good point. We do, um, you know, have people who come to our group, our support groups with, um, you know, difficulty with speech for various, various reasons. And um, I, I find that being in an environment like that, so um, not to really... Uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, but um, I'm not really trying to like promote our services so much, but um, I know for people who have challenges with communication that just uh, being in a community of people who are not judgment, you know, super not judgmental, um, who are super compassionate to boost that, um, to maybe boost your morale, boost your self-worth a little bit, um, has been really helpful for just people that I know I've worked with personally. Um, part of you know communication is of course listening. So listening with other people, um, being a support for other people, um, I find that that is 
is great. And there's no, there's certainly, there's no shame in um, being more soft-spoken or I, I find that some of the people that I admire the most say the fewest words. So um, in, in many ways, I think there's ad, admirable qualities and uh, yeah, I hope that offers some, some kind of answer to your question. That's great. We have someone here asking um, if you could reread the Tara Brock quote, quote that sure. you read. Yeah. Where is it? I think it's from Radical Acceptance. I have to, that's the book. I have to imagine it is, um, but I can't say for sure. It goes, when we put down the ideas of what life should be like, we are free to wholeheartedly say yes to life as it is. That's beautiful, thank you. I have a question in the Q&A box um, from Stephanie. I'm interested in the article you mentioned from 2005. Can you please advise where this article can be found? So that was- Ooh, um, Yeah, I can. And it's an, it's gonna be from an academic journal. So it, I don't know that it's like, you know how peer reviewed journals oftentimes are uh, not published in, in full on the internet. You might have to find someone who you know who has access to a college or university to get the full access to the publication, which is, I know, that's what I did to read the whole thing. But um, I know a great place to find the title and the authors of it is at um, our website, beyondmybottle.org on our mission page. Um, there's a short paragraph that explains essentially exactly what I was saying about um, uh, fusing emotion, you know, fusing stressors to that then get exacerbated it's one of the first paragraphs on the page. And I believe the, the word fuse is hyperlinked to that article. So I couldn't tell you the author's names off the top of my head. I think it was a counseling journal, um, a psychological counseling journal and the articles from 2005. But um, yeah, definitely find someone with a, uh, a university uh, or a college uh, database to check out that, that publication because it's great. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so I, I think we've answered all the questions in the Q&A. Do you have any last final thoughts for this webinar? Thank you all who, so much to whoever attended. Um, I hope to see you uh, at other occasions of Beyond My Battle um, personally. And it's been really an honor to speak with this group. So thank you to the Garrison Institute especially. Wonderful, thank you so much. So thank you so much Martel for being with us today and thank you for everyone who joined on this call. To learn more about uh, Martel's work, please visit www.beyondmybattle.org. One, one of our next upcoming programs is a NeuroDharma two-day online retreat with Dr. Rick, Rick Hansen on October 10th and 11th. For more information on that program, please visit garrisoninstitute.org. You can also check our website, garrisoninstitute.org, for updated listings of future sessions to view and to view the recording of this call and others. Again, we provide all these sessions free of charge. If you would like to support this effort, please consider making a donation at garrisoninstitute.org. May everyone be happy, healthy, and safe.